it's always a great pleasure to be here and it's a particular pleasure of course also to tell you about the searches we're doing at the LHC at the moment. Okay, so of course as you know there's many reasons to believe there is uh, as yet unknown physics beyond the standard model um, and I don't uh, want to go through that and there is really many new particles or theories predicted. Now what is common, what matters for my talk is that really in many cases we have jets produced. So for instance here in this is a supersymmetric diagram where squawk decays via quark or we can have lepto quarks, we can have a fourth generation of B uh, prime decaying to B z, etc. So uh, it's really a, a it's, it's, it's uh, critical that the LHC can do searches uh, with jets well. And in particular in supersymmetry, and I spent quite a bit of time on talking about SUSY searches, um, it, is, it is very important because that's where the strongest constraints on supersymmetry at this moment come from, uh, come from these searches. So, so this is here uh, the spectrum of all the SUSY particles um, and, and we're gonna concern ourselves here of course with the strongly interacting ones, particularly the squawks here and the gluino. Um, uh, one thing which I guess you've been discussing here, uh, but I just want to remind you is our general strategy for these searches. Of course, Susie is potentially very rich, has a very rich phenomenology and there's many ways in particular of breaking the uh, supersymmetry, which then impact how we best search for these particles. So, so I mean, at the LHC, we've really gone away of doing it in a particular model. We let the searches be inspired by a given model, but in the end, we're looking really for uh, signatures. So signatures are, for instance, four jets and something escaping, or three leptons, something escaping, two photons and something escaping, okay? Uh, for, for the purpose of today, I am going to comment only on searches where our parity is conserved so that the sporticals are produced in pairs. There are actually very interesting searches also, well, as you already know, it's not the punchline of my talk, I suppose. We haven't found supersymmetry yet. Um, and and uh, in order, of course, a lot of the constraints that we currently have can be evaded by, for, uh, by, for instance, assuming that air parity is not conserved and letting it be violated, in particular in the quark sector. And there are actually very interesting searches involving jets in that. But since I have only time for one lecture, I, I, you can ask me about those afterwards. Okay. And then, the, so as I said, so the strategy is, is really not to try to come up with a, a scan of the entire MSSM with more than 100 parameters, which is uh, very strongly constrained by many constraints from precision electroweak data, et cetera. But we use well-motivated benchmark models that allow us to com make comparisons between experiments and also, I mean, between collider experiments, but maybe also between uh, other experiments and, uh, and to try to make the interpretation of our data as model independent as possible. We, for instance, to, to try to, to usually not quote limits as a function of the gut scale to the particle masses, but rather at the electroweak scale. And we very often use uh, these uh, now very popular simplified models where a given production process is, is, is uh, studied and its decay. Just to remind you of a typical uh, spectrum of SUSY particles, this one is completely ruled out by the LHC already for at least three or four reasons, because the gluino here was below 800 GeV. This is now ruled out with the squawks being at around 600, But just to illustrate the point, so that mostly the colored particles are quite heavy, while uh, here the sleptons are relatively light. This, of course, doesn't have to be like this, but it's, it's just a typical spectrum. And so naively you would think, well, maybe it's better to look for the sleptons. But uh, the, the production cross-section, as you'll see in a moment, for colored particles is just much stronger at the LHC, given that we're colliding colored particles, basically, well, or particles that contain colored particles. And then, then there is also the chaginos and neutralinos, which are quite light. And I think you've heard from uh, Sunil uh, how, how uh, lepton searches constrain those. That's also, of course, very interesting. 
This shows here the production cross-sections at the LHC now. Here, this is for uh, the ATEV center of mass energy we were running in, in, in 2012. So you see the cross-section in units of picobarn as a function of the, uh, what's called the average mass, which is the, so for this two stop quarks, this is just the stop quark mass, and for squawk gluino, this is then the average of the squawk and gluino mass, just to have one simple parameter. And so there you see that, that, that for these generic uh, squawks and gluinos, we have uh, uh, the largest cross-sections here, followed then, for instance, by stop production, which I'll talk about a little bit. There is a brand new search, which I think is very interesting from uh, an experimental and theoretical point of view. And these are just much larger cross-sections than these weak production cross-sections, okay? And just, so generally speaking, it's very difficult for us to find anything if it doesn't make at least 100 events. Even 100 events, it depends a lot on how much background there is, but we, we're generally able to reduce the background to that order, dep it, uh, well, it depends a lot, but I would say if it doesn't produce at least 100 events, it's rather hopeless, let's say. So if you look at that, then you can immediately see that, that the mass range that we might hope to be sensitive to is just over about a, a TeV for these gluino and squarks, and for the stop quark, maybe about 700 GeV. As you'll see later, lighter states actually is, is more difficult to discriminate against the background, and so in fact, the mass reach is lower than, than, than this here, but for squarks and gluinos, it's approximately that. Okay, so then let's say we'll investigate now the squawk and gluino production. So the classic signature is then jets and missing ET. So we have, for instance, a diagram here like this, associated production of a squawk and a gluino. So this diagram will be uh, important if both the squawks and gluinos are at a, sen a reasonable mass. So they, are, they are both at the, uh, have this, a similar mass. If, of course, the squawk is much heavier than the gluino, then gluino pair production would dominate, and, and vice versa. If the gluino is much heavier than the squawk, squawk pair production would dominate. So this is for the intermediate case where they have similar masses, and then they decay. So, for instance, the squawk decays into a quark and this neutralino, and the gluino decays also to several jets and missing ET. It doesn't have to. For instance, here, this is a rather long cascade, so this is the neutralino 2, which can also decay to leptons, so it is very possible that leptons appear in the decay, um, but nearly always there is, as long as you have a strong production process, there's nearly always jets, and that's why this is a fantastic working horse. Just in terms of cross-section, so just to also illustrate how uh, fast it falls, so for a gluino mass of 800 GeV at the ATEV collider, we produce of the order of a thousand events per inverse femto barn, while for a gluino mass of factor two higher, we only produce one. So that we just can't reach. This will be very interesting. In tomorrow's lecture, I will talk about the LHC future, and, and, and once we have the high center of mass energy, we can access these higher masses, but not with the ATV. Okay. And so, so then the detailed signature depends on a lot, many parameters. In particular, of course, the masses of the individual particles. Um, and so, so we have a, so for instance, if the squawk masses are quite high, the gluinos decay via this uh, uh, four body, three body decay, um, to, so that we have here, we get four quarks and two neutralinos. So our signature would be four jets and missing energy. Alternatively, the gluino might be very heavy, but the squawks might be light. In that case, we have this, such a diagram, so then we look for two jets plus missing energy. Then we can also have more complicated decays that maybe the squawk doesn't prefer us to decay via a chargino compared to like the, uh, directly via neutralino. Then we get in addition Ws in the final state, which in turn Ws most of the time, again, decay to jets. They may decay to leptons, but usually they decay to jets. So then we get a signature of six jets plus missing ET. And it can be more crazy than that, so basically going back to this diagram, but now letting that decay via a chargino and then a W, so then we have eight jets plus missing ET. Or alternatively, the gluinos can decay via top quarks, and then top quarks decay to BW, and then we end up with tons of jets, again, eight jets plus missing ET, okay? 
So, so what we do in our search is we actually do indeed, we really look for two jets, three jets further into that search. What I want is thinking how experimentally we actually measure jets and missing energy because this is one of the uh, most challenging uh, things indeed. Okay, uh, so yeah, so they're among the ch most challenging uh, quantities to measure. So jets are primarily measured by the carometer um, or classically they were uh, measured by the carometer in the 80s. What has happened um, at the LHC is actually that uh, we are using tracking, charged particle tracking more and more to aid this. This is in different ways. So for instance, CMS has a so-called particle flow uh, algorithm where they try for charged particles, they are measured much more precisely by the tracker than by the carometer. So what they try to do is identify which energy deposits in the carometer are due to charged particles, subtract that off and replace it by the charge track in, in order to pr improve the precision. That also has the additional advantage that for tracks we know their origin because we know, we know exactly where they come from in, in terms of the interaction point. As I talk about in a moment, there is a lot of pileup and so to suppress pileup this has a big disadvantage. Atlas doesn't do this particle flow, but Atlas also, in order to suppress pilar, uses tracking information significantly to aid understanding which energy deposits come from the primary interaction point at which come from secondary proton-proton uh, interactions which have nothing to do with the hard scatter. Um, and, and then, so that's about jets and I'll talk about how we measure them and how we calibrate them a little bit. And then there is also missing ET. So missing ET is, uh, in its very nature, it's a derived quantity, which is basically the sum of the missing energy caused by electrons, photons, taus, jets, soft jets. So that's jets below 25 GeV. The muon cell out, that's, <laughs> that's something that isn't even in a soft jet, so that's just low energy carometer deposit that are unclustered at all. Uh, right, so this is the carometer part of the muon and this is the muon. So, so uh, yeah. So that, that's, so uh, in some sense it doesn't get calibrated separately, but if we have calibrated all of our objects separately well and understood them, then missing ET should just come out right. Okay, so let me tell you about jets. So what we really want is well, so, so these protons that are produced in the hard scatter and then they, uh, and we would like to know the four vector of these. Of course, there's already one a, a complication that the core uh, might radiate of a gluon and which we don't really care about. So we really want, uh, want the quark. But then it gets, of course, worse. These protons hadronize and this is intrinsically a non-perturbative uh, phenomenon and intrinsically not well understood. So already we're getting uncertainties here we have phenomenological models that are implemented in the Monte Carlo generators we use. So, so in particular, there's two really on the market, the Lund string model and the cluster fragmentation model. Oftentimes we compare Pythia and Herwig to assess uh, what uncertainty we are getting due to, due to the understanding of hadronization. And also during hadronization, there are some things happen like for instance that uh, a B meson decays semi-leptonically in which case there is a neutrino and there is just no way that we can experimentally ever recover that. So we're already getting a significant resolution degradation here just due to the hadronization process which, where we haven't even built any carometer that, uh, I mean the best carometer in the world can't fix that of course. Then we have the pileup is another uh, big problem. So what I mean is that we have particles from additional PP interactions. So let's say the black is our hard scatter interaction, but now we have additional proton-proton interaction and they uh, sometimes can by chance put particles on top of um, our jet. And that, that causes then an offset in our jet energy and it's basically wrong unless we take care of it. And at the LHC in 2012, this shows here the average number of interactions per crossing um, and so you see that it's about 21, 20.7 interactions per crossing on average 
in the ATEV data, significantly more factor to, uh, two more than what we had in the 70 EV data. In the future, it will actually be up to 140, as you'll see uh, tomorrow. And this is not the end of it. So, so what we, we know this, yeah, so this number of mean number of interactions per crossing we know because it's directly related to the luminosity. Uh, it's basically just the luminosity times the inelastic cross section. It gives you the number of interactions. Um, and so, so we can correct for this on average. However, the fluctuation event by event are of course large. So uh, any given event, I mean, so, so for instance, an interaction might be a diffractive interaction which completely escapes the detector, so it's no problem whatsoever, or it might be a rather violent proton-proton interaction. Um, then in addition, it's actually more difficult than this, so, so there is also so-called out-of-time pileup that um, the integration time of the Karimata and Atlas, for instance, so, so the bunch spacing time at the LHC is only 25 nanoseconds, or at, uh, actually until now we were running with 50 nanoseconds. So every 50 nanoseconds there is a new interaction coming. However, just the integration time of a signal for the karometer is 600 uh, milli nanoseconds, milliseconds, 600, no, 600 nanoseconds. So that, that basically we are observing 10 interactions in a given uh, one. So, so this, again, okay, it's just to say that uh, you can ask me about this, so this doesn't make life easier. And then, of course, so this has just all happened, this would have all happened, and this you could have done as a theorist, you could have just run Monte Carlo and tried to work out, uh, get the pile up, et cetera. But then, of course, we have to also instrument our detector, and we have our calorimeter, with which we now finally detect uh, jets, and the uh, karometer response to hadrons determines what we, uh, what we measure. So typically it's about 1% for pi zeros, which are about one third of a jet the case to, uh, is, is, is pi zeros to first order. And these decay to photons, so they are awesome uh, because they have a resolution of 1%. However, for charged hadrons, which make up about two thirds of the jet, uh, the resolution is more of the order of 10% and there is significant tails because uh, they interact uh, with, the, with the detector. There's also a tail because hadrons can actually get stuck before the entering the parameter. And then in addition, the, re the response may be non-uniform because uh, as a function of anger because often uh, we have, for instance, uh, so-called crack regions where um, due to uh, there is poorer instrumentation because we need to, oh, you know, get some pipes out or something out of the detector and so then uh, the, the resolution is even worse than those. And then last but not least, there is also noise. So any detector uh, is, 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 every detector comes with noise. It's just a question of how big the noise is. And of course, the, it, uh, which is, uh, noise is as undefined, I mean, is, is unrelated to the hard scatter, of course. Um, but it may also depend, for instance, on the instantaneous luminosity, it depends on what the origin of the electronic noise is. And that must be subtracted. Okay, so, so all these effects are then worked out and we're trying to understand and subtract so that actually what we finally do measure is independent of the pileup. It's independent of how many interactions per crossing there was because we want to, of course, measure a physics quantity that, that doesn't depend on the LHC running conditions. Um, and then in the end, we calibrate, so we correct for all of that, and then we try to calibrate this in situ with calibration processes. So what we use is, is processes like these where you have a, a QCD Compton diagram where we have a photon and a quark being produced, or a Z and a quark, and at leading order, one would expect that the photon and the quark have the same transverse momentum due to momentum balance, or the Z and the quark. So that's what we do, so we look for a photon balancing a jet, uh, which is back-to-back -back in phi, and then we look at the response, I mean, so the ratio of the jet PT to the photon PT, or the Z PT. And we do this for data and Monte Carlo. So all these effects that I told you about, the pileup, the noise, et cetera, all of this we are fully simulating in our um, uh, Monte Carlo generated events. 
and uh, a fully emulate the data. And what we then look at really is the ratio of this uh, so-called PT balance in data and Monte Carlo. And then you see this here as a function of the PT of the jet. You see it here for the triangles, which I guess are in this range above 100 GeV, is photon jet at low PT. So, so, so the reason that it's not at lower PT is that we only trigger photons if they have a PT above 80 GeV or something like that. Um, and then Z plus jet is, is these we try to keep every Z there is, so, so this, uh, this complements it here at low, low momentum. And then multi-jet, this is basically using Mercedes type, Mercedes star type topology events where we have two low PT jet balancing. Uh, so, so here instead of a Z, we have, would have two low PT jets balancing a high PT jet. And you see that this data, this is all lines up at one, which is nice. So that means that our simulation actually accurately predicts this to within the uncertainty, and the uncertainty you see is given here is this uh, orange uh, and greenish uh, band. So, so, so we understand this at the level of about 2% uh, at low momentum and 1% and, and at high momentum. So that's uh, quite impressive given how many effects we are concerned about. And this just shows here the, relat the, the relative uh, components to this systematic uncertainty. So one thing we are, for instance, also considering is quark jets versus gluon jets separately. So in this process, we're mostly looking at quark jets. Then in the Monte Carlo, we can study the difference between quark and gluon jets and the response. And all of this is considered when we quote systematic uncertainties. The other thing is the jet energy resolution. So this is very critical, for instance, um, uh, for if we look for high mass resonances like a die jet resonance or a three jet resonance, the better the resolution, the better we can find it. It's also critical, for instance, for the Higgs to BB bar, which I think you heard about earlier. Uh, so, so this shows here the resolution as a function of, uh, the, of the PT of the jet. So th and, and you see, so for instance, for a 100 GeV jet, we achieve about a 10% resolution and it gets better with increases. So at a thousand, it's nearly as good as 5%. And at low energies, this is where it's worse, at about 30 GeV, it, it, it goes up to nearly 20%. Okay, and this is here in CMS, starting at 50. It's quite similar to Atlas. Actually, so, so but then I wanted to show you, so the pileup is rather, uh, is, is really very important and has, 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 this is just a way, because for theorists, it's, it's never so obvious, well, why don't you just do that analysis again? You did it in 7 TV, it can't be very hard to redo it in 8 TV, right? And, and naively, I would agree with that, but the issue is that we have then these new experimental challenges to control the pilot. It wasn't really causing us a lot of experimental problems yet in 7 TV, but in 8 TV, it is partially prohibitive because some background can increase by a factor of 10 easily just because of this larger pileup. So for instance, what I show you here is the number of pileup jets per unit eta. The black here shows if we do, shows uh, in the central region. Uh, and you see that for instance, for a pileup of 20, there is, uh, there is about 0.1 jet per unit eta in the detector, okay? So if I have, I mean, so it's per unit eta, normally I have uh, at least four units of eta that I integrate over in any given physics analysis. So basically in every event I have like half, to, half a jet or one jet if I don't do anything, okay? So that's of course not acceptable and so, so we actually have methods of suppressing that by requiring that these jets then stem from the interaction vertex for instance, okay? So this is something that then it's, it becomes, new techniques are being developed as, as we go to higher pileup. On this here shows the resolution, how the resolution, the jet resolution degrades as a function of mu. Again, this is the, uh, the number of interactions per crossing. So the black is if we don't do anything. And then the blue shows what we're actually doing now, which is called the row times area, jet area correction, which is actually a technique that was worked out by Matteo Cacciari and Gavin Salam in 2007 already. And we just now uh, resurrected that and that's what we're now using where you use the average 
average, um, average jet energy in the event basically to, to correct for this. And then you see that we can recover here resolution. So we're going from 10% here to 8%. So that's a 20% relative improvement, which is very significant. Uh, so then the other really very dangerous thing is that we get missing ET due to these, um, uh, due, to, due to, for instance, pileup. And here I just show you again, so, so the missing ET resolution here in black, this is again the default, what we get. So for events which have no missing ET at, at for events and have 25 primary vertices, we just on average generate a missing ET of 25 GeV. Okay, that's huge. Then what we do is a pileup suppression, again using these tracks and also this jet area correction, and then we're getting down to only 10 GeV. So these techniques are very important. If we don't have them, so what do you see here? This is even after pileup suppression, the missing ET distribution for dilepton events. So this is dominated here by Z2 mu mu events, okay, which have no intrinsic missing ET, in particular not in the Monte Carlo, which is the yellow here. But you see, you see that even for ETMS greater than 100 GeV, there is a significant fraction of that. So there's really no missing ET whatsoever, but we do observe it all the way out to 150 GeV still due to mismeasurements, okay? So, so understanding this is, 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 is highly non-trivial. So, so this, this shows here that indeed the data is also shown here in black and you see that we are understanding this spectrum at the level of 10 or 20 percent. This is, for instance, critical for, uh, for uh, many searches of new physics. Okay, so that's the end of the interlude. So just to explain to you how difficult uh, it is actually to measure jets and missing in T, but uh, nevertheless, we've managed, I hope I have convinced you that we managed to do it after all. Okay, so then, so we understand our jets, we understand our missing ET, and we know what we want to look for, so then we need to come up with a strategy of how we do this, and most of the time, well, so, so let me just tell you about this jets plus missing ET generic analysis, so typically we require large missing transverse energy. This is in fact usually what we trigger on due to these neutralinos, then we require large HT, where HT is the sum of the transverse energies of all the jets which can be, as I said, between any number between two and 10. Then we typically it, it require that the missing ET is not aligned any of those jets. Uh, so this is in order to reduce this mismeasurement. So the missing ET, uh, the mismeasurement I showed you on the previous slide is mostly caused from a jet which is severely undermeasured, okay? Uh, so this suppresses that. And then we veto, because this is not we're doing a zero, so called it's zero lepton analysis, we veto uh, leptons in order to, and when I say leptons here, this means really electrons and muons. Usually we don't veto taus because many jets also identified as taus. Taus are much more difficult. So, so we veto electrons and muons. And so then we have our selection and then the procedure is that we define based on our simulated samples and on our background uh, modeling, we define some cuts for a so-called signal region, which is where we ultimately want to search for our SUSE events. Then we also define control regions, which are orthogonal to the signal region, but they're, a, but they, 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 and that they probe a given background, but that they are, uh, related, I mean, so they're not too far away from the signal region so that it tells us that if we understand the background in this control region, then we can also believe it in our signal region. That's the purpose of these control region or validation regions as they're called. We generally keep the data actually blind. We usually don't emphasize this in our uh, papers because we unblind, I mean, we don't make a lot of uh, issues about it, but but generally the data are kept blind until quite late in the approval stage. Uh, so, so and which means basically until the control regions are well understood. This is mostly to safeguard us against accidentally trying to tune a signal away or it just doesn't help to look at the data until you have convinced yourself to look, you understand the background. That's basically it. And then, then in the end, once we've understood all this and, and uh, these things, then we can open the blind box, which is always exciting. 
So, so just to show you um, how this works, so this is the QCD diejet rejection cut. So this shows the delta phi between a jet and the missing ET, well, the missing ET and the closest jet. And so you see here this in orange is the QCD multi-jet background, and we're cutting this at 0.4, which you can see gets rid of all this background. You also see that we actually, by, by, by now looking here what's happening below 0.4, we see um, whether the data are modeled by this, I, I mean, whether we understand the QCD multi-jet background in terms of normalization, and you see that we do here, that the data agree, uh, agree well with that. Okay, so and then, so then the remaining, once we've cut that, this background is then plays a, a very minor role in this particular search, and the remaining backgrounds are uh, W plus jets, which mostly comes from the case where the W decays to a tau and a neutrino, then Z plus jets, which mostly comes from the case where the Z decays to two neutrinos, and TT bar, which mostly comes again from the case where one of the Ws from the top decay decays to a tau. So we then have um, a control regions to address them, and in particular what we do is we invert the lepton veto to probe the W plus jets and the TT bar, then we're of course not probing the tau component, but of course we understand very well how often a tau W decays to a tau versus to a muon, the same number of times, so, so by controlling it with electrons and muons, we, we can understand this background, and the Z plus jets, we are uh, requiring then two leptons. So this is shown here, so this shows here, so, so the, the background, what we're trying to understand is, is Z plus jets, and in order to do that, we, we use photon plus jets events. And then theoretically, the, uh, the ratio of Z plus jets to photon jets is very well predicted. So, so we can, uh, from this, we can infer the Z plus jets uh, background. So we just require an isolated photon in addition to everything else. And then we look here at the so-called M effective distribution. So that's just the missing ET plus, the sum of all the jet PTs, which we're also going to use later. And then you see how the data agree with this background very well. Then, uh, then the W plus jets, well, the multi-jets already showed you, we reverse this delta phi cut. Then the W plus jets, we now require that there is a lepton and that the transverse mass between the lepton and missing ET is consistent with the W boson mass, and we require that to be no B jets. And then this is the blue here is the W plus jets. You see that this is dominant in this region, and again, the data are well modeled by the background, Monte Carlo, and then finally top background is exactly the same as W plus jets, but instead of vetoing a B, we now select a B, and that way we strongly enhance the TT bar background, and again you see that uh, there is good agreement, okay? So, so in fact, if we don't see good agreement, and that, that happens in these control regions, we usually adjust, we renormalize the background to agree with the data. And then, okay, so once we've understood all these backgrounds, we can look in the signal region and find our events. So this is a very nice candidate event. So this has very violent events. So it has four jets. The highest PT one is 974 GeV. It has also a missing ET of 984 and an effective mass of 2441. It doesn't come out so well here. There's one jet, two jet, three jet. I'm not sure where the fourth one is. And so this shows then the data in a variety of signal regions here with two jets plus missing energy, five jets plus missing energy, eight jets plus missing energy. And this shows here in both cases the M effective distribution. What you see in all cases so is the same color scheme as before. So, so unfortunately, uh, my experimental colleagues have in their infinite wisdom have decided to make the main background dark so that you can't see the black dots on top of the dark background. But um, the, you see that in the, in the ratio that the data agree well with the background. We would expect SUSY to come in here at high masses. That's what we would hope. And here are some hypothetical uh, SUSY signal uh, samples that, uh, that, that, that you see, but unfortunately the data do not show any, any axis here. And this is here a different quantity, which is often used, which is so called the missing ET significance, which is the missing ET divided by the square root of some ET. Um, so for events which don't have any intrinsic missing ET, this is usually peaked low. So this is this multi-jet background you see is below five. 
um, and, and for a signal with genuine missing in T, this is expected to be high, and so this dashed line here is a hypothetical SUSY signal. Okay, but unfortunately there is no, no access, and so we use then these data to, to constrain, um, constrain supersymmetry, so, so, uh, so here in this left-hand diagram, what is shown here, and we're gonna show, look at uh, quite a few plots of these, is the neutralino mass as a function of the gluino mass, and what this simpl it is a simplified model where the only production mechanism is this one where we have gluinos decay via squawks into a four quark plus two LSP final state. So the squawks are assumed to be very heavy here, and uh, so you see what we are constraining here is indeed gluino masses up to about 1.4 TeV. So this corresponds to what I told you in the beginning, that's where we'd get about 100 events. And then the LSP mass, for LSP masses below about 400 or 500 GeV. So, so if the LSP mass is larger than that, say 800 or so, what happens is that these jets typically get softer and then the analysis is not that sen uh, uh, sensitive yet, okay? And so that's why we're not more sensitive in this direction. And in this direction, we're just running out of cross-section to produce the particles. Um, so this is a different view here. So this is now constraining it in the a plane of squawk mass versus gluino mass. So where all these diagrams play, uh, uh, play into it and, and dominant in different regions. So for instance, at large gluino mass, it's this dominates this diagram, while as large squawk mass, low gluino mass, this diagram dominates. And so here you see for, let's say, at, at on the diagonal where they have similar masses, we're even constraining up to about 2 TeV in squawk mass and 1.6 TeV in the gluino mass. Again, this depends, so that this is the red line, this is if the LSP has zero mass. As the mass of the LSP increases, these limits get weaker, and as you see here with these blue lines and these green lines, okay? So the green line, for instance, uh, we can't constrain above 2 TeV if the, if the LSP mass is 700 GeV. Okay, so this is just what I wanted to show you about inclusive jets and supersymmetry. Another very important aspect is, of course, to tag B jets, which we do experimentally by exploiting the large lifetime of the B hadron. So the B hadron flies, uh, flies some distance before it decays. So this this, it has a lifetime of 1.5 uh, picoseconds. Picoseconds, not inverse picoseconds. Um, and, 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 and that means that it, 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 uh, it's about a distance of uh, 460 microns, so half a millimeter that it travels before it decays. It can even be more depending on how boosted it is, okay? And so this we can experimentally exploit because we, our silicon detector resolution, typically the point resolution is of the order of 10 to 15 microns, okay? So it's significantly better than this. So, so basically we have a primary vertex here where the hard interaction takes place, then a B hadron gets produced, it travels for a little while, and then it decays. And then uh, in that decay, uh, it, it, it produces uh, these charged tracks and it, uh, we, we do have two major techniques to tag this. One is to try to explicitly look for such secondary vertices where we look for several tracks that intersect with each other. And the other technique is to not even bother doing that, but just to see other tracks which, if we extrapolate them back to the uh, beam line, that they don't match at all the primary vertex. What we call it, this, the jargon is used as large D0 significance. D0 is the distance of closest approach of the extrapolation back of the track to the primary vertex. Um, and so the significance of that is the value divided by its uncertainty. So if that's large, it means there is a significant displacement and so it's most likely from a secondary interaction rather than a primary track, like these prompt tracks. Okay, so, so these algorithms are actually very complex so, so usually so such quantities that the G0 of all these tracks is stuck into a neural network together with a secondary vertex, which has also, uh, the, this distance is plugged in. Another discriminant variable is also that B hadron mass is quite high. 
So just looking at the invariant mass of these tracks at the vertex is also used for quantity. So, so there's like 10 or 20 uh, uh, quantities that are useful, that discriminate B, B uh, jets from other jets. And so these are typically put into a neural network type algorithm uh, that then uh, does something smart in order to get the maximum power for tagging Bs and rejecting everything else. And this is then usually quantified in plots like these. So what's shown here on the x-axis is the B-jet efficiency and on the y-axis the light-jet rejection. Okay, so what we want, we want really high efficiency and we want really high rejection. So we want to be in this upper right corner in the ideal world, okay? Um, so, so what's best, so and then we have your many curves. The black one is what Atwalas uses, the so-called MV1, multivariate one, that's where it comes from, because uh, it's this black line here, where for instance, for an efficiency, if we want an efficiency of 70% for tagging B quarks, we get a light jet rejection of 140, okay? Right, so one in 140 light jets gets mistagged as a B. Uh, we, can, we can do better than that if we, if we are in analysis, we want really high purity and maybe we can sacrifice efficiency because we have infinite statistics. We can also go for 50% B tagging efficiency and now we get a rejection here of 3,000 or so. So only one in 3,000 light jets gets mistagged. So this can be selected for a given analysis as people, you know, want to, as, 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 as is best for a given analysis. And then there is a similar plot here on the right, which is the B-jet efficiency against the charm jet rejection. That's much worse, as you can see. So again, for a 70% B-jet efficiency, we have a charm, charm rejection of only a factor of five. So meaning 20% of all charm jets get mis misidentified as B-jets. And I'll also tell you a little, I mean, uh, so, so this also what it, well, I'll tell you afterwards. Uh, so, so I'll also tell you a bit about charm tagging later because this is also now being done, but this is much more difficult. Uh, okay, but we'll talk about that later. So why, why do we look for B-jets? B-jets are uh, very interesting because the third generation may be closely related to, uh, well, it's closely related to the whole naturalness argument. Um, so in the natural argument, is, so here's a slide from Nima, is that, that the bottom and the stop should be light. So the stop in particular needs to cancel the uh, large divergence due to the top loop. And then they mix and so they both become light and at least Nima thinks that they should be below like 400 GeV. And then there is a second order, uh, at second order then also the gluino should be relatively light because that introduces basically a hierarchy problem in the stop. I'm sure this has been discussed at this conference so I won't uh, go into that. So for me as an experimentalist this just means that I want to look for the case where just these are the only particles that are quite light and I can just let, let, let now all the other squawks be, be very heavy. So that, what, what does then happen experimentally? And what happens is that then the gluino, for instance, decays either via stop quarks to a four top plus two LSP uh, final state or via bottom quarks, for instance, to a four B plus two LSP uh, uh, final state, okay? Uh, so this is very important to look for. And in all cases, the stop, of course, decays via B quarks, so in all cases, we have several B quarks. And as I'll show you, the most sensitive search is actually a search where we just look for three B jets plus missing energy. It's very sensitive to both these cases. Now, of course, um, the gluino might be heavier. Uh, and so another thing we are also doing is to look for direct pair production of these uh, stop or bottom quarks uh, in diagrams like these. So these are less spectacular because here we only have two top quarks plus missing energy. And so you can maybe imagine that there is a large background due to just ordinary top quark production because the only discriminant we have is this large missing energy. While here to have four top quarks, this is not as likely to happen in the standard model. <laughs> so the three B jet plus missing in T search, so it's basically similar to the jets plus missing in T searches conceptually that I explained to you earlier. Apart from now, of course, we just require three B jets. 
and then, but then we have also a variety of signal regions still varying the number of jets we require, and in this analysis, there's also separate analysis requiring either zero or one lepton. So, because of course for the stop case, it is quite likely when you have four top quarks that maybe one of them decays via a leptonic W decay, and so the one lepton analysis is quite important. This shows here the missing ET distribution for the zero lepton case. So we have three B jets greater than 50 GeV, four jets total, um, and here this is the missing ET distribution, and you see that the, uh, uh, oh, this is not actually, yeah, so, so the, uh, the background isn't particularly well. So the reducible background, what is, um, this is actually background due to a multi-B jet production without top quarks, and the green is basically the top background. And you see that a signal is this dashed line, this is what we would expect from a signal here, an excess of high missing ET, but the data do not show this at the moment. So here then, we have a similar plane as before here, the gluino mass versus the mass of the uh, LSP, and you see that we are here again excluding gluinos up to about 1.4 TeV, as long as the LSP mass is below about 600 GeV, okay? So this is basically already excluding that diagram from NEMA, in fact. Okay, so, all right. But okay, I think he can be persuaded to put it to 1.5 or something and then we're still okay. Okay, so what about charm jets? So this is uh, uh, about B jets. Uh, charm jets have traditionally not been worried about so much at Hadron Colliders. Most of all because there wasn't as strong of a motivation, for instance, uh, B tagging is also critical for studying the top quark at the Teva tunnel was developed for the first time at a Hadron Collider for this. Um, charm jets just, they have a much shorter lifetime than the Bs, and so this is actually contaminated by both light and by B background significantly. So typically what we can achieve is efficiency for tagging charm of about 20%. At this working point, we only get a factor of five for Bs, which by a factor of five is equivalent to 20%, right? So that means that we actually tag 20% of the Bs at the same time. So, so we're not even better at tagging charm than B, even if we try to tag charm, okay? And the light jet rejection can still be quite good. Now it is, it might be quite important though, again, to probe the third generation. So for instance, the stop actually could decay to a charm and the LSP um, if, if there's no other decays kinematically open. So we would have stop pair production like this and while normally the stop would decay to a top and a neutralino or something, if the mass of it is so low that it can't do that, it might decay via a three body decay to a charm and a neutralino. So this is actually was presented for the first time last week at the EPS conference in Stockholm and uh, so, so here these jets, since the stop, what we're talking about here is a stop of a maybe like 150 GeV or so. And the LSP is maybe 70 or 80 or 100 or something, so the charm is rather soft. So we don't even trigger on this signature. We don't trigger on a signature which says 250 GeV jets and some missing energy. So what we actually require here is that there is a hard jet from initial state radiation in order to trigger this. So we require missing into above 150 and a leading jet above 120. That's not one of these charm jets, but just something that got radiated earlier. And then we require at most, at, at most three or more jets with some PT greater than 30 GeV. And so this shows here the leading jet PT distribution and in fact the signal, it's maybe not that easy to see, it's not particularly uh, sensitive to the leading jet PT. We're looking for an overall excess in this distribution, which we don't see. And so, so this is this brand new uh, result. So this shows again the LSP mass as a function of the stop mass. And uh, this, this range here at high masses is not allowed kinematically. It wouldn't decay to a charm and a neutralino, then it would decay to a B and a W and a neutralino, which where we have a separate search that looks for that. And then uh, in this region, it's not allowed either because then the stop mass would be it couldn't decay into this either. So, so we're only looking in this narrow band here, and this blue area, so basically stop masses below about 170 for neutralino masses below 100 was excluded by CDF before with 2.6 inverse femtoborans, 
And this red area is now what this new result uh, constrains. So it's, it's very significant going up to stop masses of 200 GeV for LSP masses below 200 GeV or so. This, is a very, this was a very natural open window that still existed, which is now closed. Of course, we, there's still other natural windows. Of course, it could easily be 300 GeV and 250 for, for all I know, which would still be very natural. But, uh, and so this is the a large, this is a plot which is very often shown. Maybe somebody has shown it at this conference. So this is the new search that I was just showing. So the LSP mass as a function of the stop mass for different, de all these different colors are basically different ways it can decay. And so we're very much attacking this plane with about 10 analyses trying to, um, uh, uh, trying to, uh, to, to get as much sensitivity as we possibly can. And this is the one that I just showed you here where decays to a charm and neutralino. This here is the three body decay to a WB and a neutralino. And this is where it goes di directly to a top and a neutralino. Okay, and just to show you, so, so many of these searches are then ultimately, we also compare the sensitivity of them overall in, in this M Sugra model, which is not considered a very viable model anymore, but um, so, so just to, so for instance, the two to six jet analysis I showed you uh, is here this, this purple one. Okay, so it's, this, this is M one half and this is M zero, so this, uh, goes like that, and then the 3B jet zero plus one lepton is much weaker in the region of low M zero, but then is significantly stronger in the region of high M zero. And similarly here, the seven to 10 jets is also stronger in the high region. What's the red one again? Okay, so that's one lepton plus jets plus missing ET. So, so you see that these searches are uh, uh, partially complementary also in this, in this plane. Okay, so I am done with supersymmetry. I just want to give you a bit of a flavor also for other things we can look for with jets. So, so we can look for high mass uh, resonances. In particular, we can look either for resonances via diagrams like these with some S-channel exchange of a particle, which could, uh, we're looking for excited quarks um, decaying to a quark and a gluon, which would give us two jets. We're also looking for two B jets. We can look for two top quarks which is, for instance, predicted uh, by Randall syndrome KK gluon decays and or a, we can look for a W prime or a charged Higgs decaying to TB. Okay, so this is, there's a very broad spectrum of important searches there. Uh, and the other thing that can happen is rather than having s channel resonance production, we could have a contact interaction type thing where we have a, an effective four point vertex like in Fermi's beta decay, which could be, med uh, be by some the, the mediation of some high mass t, uh, particle in the T channel. So this shows here some examples. This is here from CMS. Actually, I should apologize. I am mostly, I've shown a lot of Atlas plots. The reason is mostly that I'm more familiar with them, but CMS has also uh, very many similar and excellent searches, of course. So this shows here the cross section of DIGET, uh, DIGET uh, events as a function of the mass. So it, it goes here from one TeV up down to four and a half TeV. And then we're looking for a bump uh, in, in the spectrum here by some new physics mechanism. This here shows the significance of, I mean, the it compares the reason of the data with the uh, background expectation uh, in units of significance. So there is no single fluctuation that is bigger than two sigma. Uh, in the data, so this uh, means the data agree with the background expectation. Another thing we sometimes do is use a variable, what in this case called f chi, which is defined as the, um, basically this spectrum for central jets divided by the total. So, so the reason here is that um, new physics high mass particles are mostly produced centrally, while QCD background is more peaked forward. So you enhance, so you expect new physics to have a, a positive, I mean, so, so the, a relatively larger fraction of central events compared to total events than QCD background. And you see, then this is shown here as a function of MJJ. And you see here, for instance, this Q star, so that's an excited quark, would make a peak in this F chi distribution at a given value, while, for instance, a contact interaction would result in it blowing up at very high masses, okay? 
So the reason that such a variable is used is actually to reduce systematic uncertainties. And so then we, we can, can use this again to set limits. So this, is, this shows limits on the cross section times branching ratio times the acceptance, which in this search is typically of the order of 40 or 50%. Um, and so then here on the left, I'm showing it for a diquark resonance and on the right for a quark gluon resonance. So an excited quark is for instance a quark gluon resonance and then W prime for instance a QQ resonance, okay? And so the blue shows here the observed limits and here the red and then there's these different cross sections of theoretical models drawn through here. Uh, so, but there are no resonance structures observed. Another thing uh, which is very interesting is I understand that Jesse Taylor has talked a lot about jet substructure and indeed we use those also to improve uh, the sensitivity for our searches and it's very important in the reason once we have an S-channel resonance for instance which is much heavier than the top quark, um, let's say a Kaluza-Klein gluon of 2 TeV, in fact our normal technique for, for reconstructing top quark doesn't work anymore because they're so boosted that all the top quark decay products basically are so close to each other that we don't separately uh, resolve anymore, uh, let's say this, the two jets from the W and the, the B jets, they are all in one. So instead of trying to resolve them, uh, we are looking just for one fat jet and then we're analyzing the substructure of that fat jet to, to see whether that's consistent with the top quark. Uh, there's been a lot of innovation as I'm sure um, Jesse demonstrated uh, in this area recently. That's, uh, I, I don't want to go through that. So, but algorithms we, for instance, used to extract the top quark are the so-called HEP top tagger and the top template tagger developed by Tilman Plain and Gilad Perez, for instance. And just to show you how, how well this works, so this shows here for the leading jet. So this is where we're looking for events where we have two top quarks both decaying fully hadronically, okay? So it's basically an event with two fat jets, okay? And then we're looking for the leading jet, we're looking at the, I mean, we've done trimming, etc. cetera, so, so there's no uh, pileup issues. And we then look for the invariant mass of the leading, leading fat jet. And for top background, you see we get a very nice peak near the top mass, while for the multi-jet background, we get this. So this is according to simulation. On the right hand side you see the actual data distribution and I, I think it's very beautiful, it's just quite amazing that we're able out of two fat digits, we actually are able to pick out the signal. Uh, so you see a very clear top peak um, at about the right mass on top of this background, okay? So we do this for both of these fat jets, we top tag them. So it's like basically instead of B tagging, now we do top tagging and then we plot their invariant mass and this is shown here. And we actually have, I mean, so the main, so these algorithms are so, so powerful that even though the QCD cross-section for jets is so much larger than the TT bar cross-section, I don't know by how much, but several factors of a thousand at least, uh, um, we are able to get a purity here of top TT bar events of about 80%, so the multi-jet background is only 20% because this is, it's very powerful how well we can tag top quarks using these techniques. And then, okay, so fine, so then we search for it and then unfortunately we don't see it, so, so this is the limit, so we're setting here limits of the order of one picobarons in, this is using different, uh, right, so this is, ah, okay, so this uses the uh, hadronic search where both top quarks decay hadronically, this is a, a search which is actually slightly more powerful at the moment, which uses the case where one top quark decays leptonically and the other one decays hadronically. Uh, and you see that we're here sensitive to masses up to 2 TeV. Okay, do I still have time? Yes? Okay, good, all right, wonderful. Then let me tell you about monojets. I wanted to leave some time for question anyway. I think I, it'll be 10 more minutes or so. So monojet, so, so um, this has recently, uh, this has caused a lot of interest recently as you, as in, 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 and its relationships so of the, the Hadron Collider monojet searches and how they relate to the searches for dark matter in direct detection experiments like Xenon 100, 
uh, lag CDMS, etc. Okay, so so because of course uh, the diagram. So in uh, in direct production, what happens is that you have a dark matter particle coming in from the universe, from the galaxy, or whatever, scattering off a standard model particle, which is in our Xenon 100 experiment, and then a standard model particle recoils and the dark matter particle escapes. And we're looking for the recoil of this, 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 this hadronic particle here in our detector. At colliders, we, are, uh, we have the same diagram, but we going in now in a different direction. Here we have two standard model particles coming out of our protons in, at the LHC, for instance, and they can annihilate and produce two dark matter particles, depending on exactly what's happening in this blob, which is, of course, key. Okay, and then there is this indirect detection, which basically goes that we have dark matter annihilation going into two standard model particles. So what we're looking, so, so the problem is if we just have this, two standard model particles colliding, making two dark matter particles, and dark matter particles, of course, intrinsically, don't really interact very often, and so they're not observable in our detector because they don't, so, so we see two star, so it looks like a minimum bias event to us if this happens. But it has been uh, realized that of in some fraction of the time, or well actually in some level always, there is some initial state radiation that, that uh, a, a photon or a jet can be uh, radiated. And, uh, and sometimes this can be very hard radiation. So uh, in order for us to trigger the event, we need this to be at least 120 or 150 GeV. And, but this happens in about 5% of the cases, okay? So, so of course, 95% of the uh, cases this is invisible, but this 5% we can capitalize on and try to understand whether using that we are able to constrain such processes. And either with a jet or a photon, as I say. Of course, uh, the photon so there's, there's a coupling factor between the two. So this, this then complements the uh, direct detection experiment. So this uh, slide was shown last week, which I thought was very amusing. So this is the interest in dark matter as a function of year as, as quantified by how many papers there are with the title dark matter in the title. So that's, that's this beige ones. That's the number of papers with dark matter in the title. So you see there's been a strongly growing interest and the white, just as a calibration result, is the number of papers with Higgs in the title. Starting, so there's none above before 1973. I don't know, they don't have 1964 on the plot. Although I don't think that had the, uh, of course that didn't have the name Higgs in the title anyway. I only had it as, as the author. <laughs> um, anyway, and so, so then it plateaued in the 90s and then it kept increasing and, and, and in fact the dark matter interest uh, overtook the Higgs interest in about 2003, as you can see, and only just like in 2012, we had to discover the Higgs in order for this trend to be reversed again. Um, so, well, okay, so let's hope that dark matter follows the similar trend that it'll then also be discovered <laughs> and then overtakes the Higgs again, maybe, we'll see. Okay, so, uh, so there's a lot of interest in it. So how, how do we uh, look for it at colliders? So what we're doing is we're searching for events which have large missing energy. Um, well, we also, so, so well, so the problem is that, as I told you, there can be noise and this noise can actually be quite violent. So we have so-called cleaning cuts to, to make sure that the jet is uh, healthy as we would expect it from a QC, you know, a jet from a quark and not, is not just a noise burst in our carometer. Then we require this, uh, this clean jet to, to have a PT greater than 120 GeV and to be reasonably central, and uh, we rec and there should can there may be so 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 in order to retain high acceptance, we allow there to be an additional jet due to, for instance, uh, uh, further QCD radiation of this ISR jet of uh, 30 GeV or so. And then, in order to uh, reject QCD background, require that the jet and the missing ET, the, so the subleading jet and the missing ET must not be aligned. Again, if, if otherwise in a dijet configuration, what would happen is you have one jet, you have the other jet, and this is mismeasured, and it would immediately give you missing ET. So this is uh, vetoed with this delta phi selection, and then we also veto any leptons in the event, okay? And then, then, then we 
uh, in fact, we uh, make uh, uh, several signal regions depending with different missing ET and, and jet PT cuts. The main background, so as you can see, this actually then shows the missing ET distribution as we see it in our data. The black is the data points and all these colored uh, histograms are the various backgrounds and as you can see, the dominant ones are here, the orange and the green background and the orange is uh, Z decaying to neutrinos and the green is W decaying to a lepton and neutrino where the lepton is a tau. And so you see that the data are, uh, are in good agreement with the background modeling and you also see, so here, so these, these um, different dashed lines, they show various uh, new physics signal models so in fact, I, I didn't talk about this, I, I actually don't talk much about extra dimensional thought, but so here the um, blue, for instance, shows uh, the ADD model for a uh, two extra dimension and a fundamental scale of three TeV. So, so in such models, you would also expect, actually what happens there is you basically make associate production of a graviton and a uh, paratonic gluon, typically, and so you also get missing ET plus a single jet. Um, and then this, what's here, the red, the red is this dashed. So this is one uh, operator which uh, corresponds to this dark matter production called D6 here. Uh, about these operators, I think you should ask Catherine and not me in the end. Um, yes, and then there is some other, ah, right, so this is a gravitino, uh, gravitino uh, associate production with the gluon. So, so, I mean, this search, of course, if we did actually see an axis here, there's really a million and one ideas on how, what physics could cause it. We don't have a lot of information about the event. All we know then is that there is a monojet and with large missing ET, something else gets produced. What then is, is, is going to be difficult to see? But okay, it would be still a very unfortunate situation to be in, but we're not in that situation. We don't see it. So what we then do is we can convert using this uh, effective operators, we can convert a, well, we can basically set a limit on the cross section and we can convert this to the um, a dark matter nucleon cross section in which the direct detection experiments usually are displaying the results. So here this, this right hand side one is maybe the most familiar one. So here you see for instance the xenon 100 being the most uh, sensitive here, probing cross sections down to 10 to the minus 44, um, and then here different well, cogen, CDMS, etc. So as you can see here in, in this on the right hand side, so the here uh, th for the spin independent case, the LHC is not very sensitive. The LHC does not have a cutoff at low masses because it's just invisible. So in general, it doesn't have a strong mass dependence at all. Um, for the spin dependent case, it can be quite competitive. And then finally, um, so there's, uh, as I said, so there's really been a lot of innovation, in particular in this area of looking for boosted topologies. And one very recent spin-off of this is the a mono W search that Atlas has just released. So rather than now looking for a mono jet or a mono photon, we can look for another mono thing. So for instance, a mono W. And in fact, it's when I say mono W, it's either mono W or mono Z. Okay. Um, so, so what we're looking for is now a fat jet with, which has a mass uh, around the W mass or the Z mass uh, and in fact we can in general also look for monotops but this analysis we haven't, haven't released yet. Um, anyway, so, so this shows then here the jet mass distribution for events where you, again we have large missing energy, a fat jet and then we're looking at the mass of this jet and so you see the background is, is flat in this. Background is mostly Z to neutrinos uh, recoiling against the jet. And then a signal might show up here, uh, here in, in this range of ADGEV. And in fact, depending on, so, so you can play with these operators, if we just have the operator um, couple the same way to up and down quarks, then this is shown here in red and uh, is actually worse than the search that I just showed you, which is here in gray, so it's, 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 it's less uh, sensitive. 
However, if it couples to them with the opposite sign, because there's interference between these diagrams, then you can hugely enhance the cross-section, and then it, this is, for instance, more sensitive, which is here, this black line. So, excluding basically three orders magnitude more uh, here. Unfortunately, again, we are setting exclusion limits here and are not, uh, not seeing any, any signal. Okay, so then uh, let me come to my conclusion. So, so, so there's a lot of viable scenarios of new physics that predict signatures that involve jets at Hadron Colliders. And, and, and in fact, both in strong production processes where one would expect it naively in any case, but also for weak production processes, as I just showed you in the end in the monojet uh, search. Um, Jets are complex and difficult to understand, and typically we have uncertainties that range to from two to five percent. Then there is a large program using B jets, and they are particularly interesting uh, to probe new physics related to the third generation, of course. And we typically have efficiencies of about finding them of about seventy percent. As I said, there's really been a lot of innovation in the area of top W and Z tagging, and this will only become more important as we go to higher center of mass energy. Of course, the boosts of any of these objects will be bigger, and so it's actually, it becomes more important. And this is also, I like this a lot, because this is a very nice collaboration between theorists and experimentalists. Although I should also say that it is also fun, a fantastic collaboration between experimentalists and theorists is also the fact that theorists very often point out where there are maybe holes in our search strategy and design a particular simplified model so that we are making sure that we are covering it. For instance, the stop the charm. Okay, fine, this was actually known for a long time, but it's still good if the theorists put pressure on us to investigate it so that we make sure we do it because there's so many things to do that as an experimentalist, it's um, uh, uh, important that, that the most important things are, are pointed out. Anyway, so there have been many searches of new, for new physics with JITS. I only showed you really a very a tiny uh, glimpse of it um, uh, with, uh, and already with really many searches with a full data set. And unfortunately, there's no new signs of new physics yet, but they will, of course, these searches will again be in the limelight in 2015 when we're at nearly twice the center of mass energy. Thank you.